Right, the lady has officially given us the go ahead to start. <laughs> um, I, I've gotten so used to waiting to hear the recording in progress sound. Uh, so welcome everybody who is joining us today. Uh, while you are joining, uh, if you would like to code along with me, there is a plugin that we're going to be working on as well as a theme that we're going to be working on. So I'm pasting those in the chat very quickly. Um, the theme, the theme is actually just a child theme of the 2023 theme. So you will need the 2023 theme installed on your multi-site install as well, if you want to follow along. Um, I'm going to be trying to cover everything I have planned for today. Uh, it, it's quite a, quite a lot to cover in a short space of time, but we'll, we'll chat about that as we go through. Um, while you are joining us, if you would like to, please let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. Um, and, and maybe let me know. Let's think about an interesting question to ask today. What is your favorite uh, food? What is your comfort food? Um, my comfort food is lasagna. Uh, I am, I am, I'm like Garfield. I love lasagna. Uh, give me lasagna any day of the day or night or week. I'll eat it cold for breakfast. Um, I'll have it for lunch. I'll have it for dinner anytime in the day or night. Uh, so let us know where you're from and what your comfort food is. If you don't know what the term comfort food is, you know, the food that you is your go to. Uh, it makes you happy. It reminds you maybe of home or it's just, you know, it gives you when you're feeling down. It's, it's that food that just cheers you up and, and makes you feel great. Uh, Thelma is, Thelma's in Morocco. I didn't know you were in Morocco. Wow. Um, you get all over the place, don't you? <laughs> Thelma says, hi from Morocco. My, com my, my comfort food is anything with cheese. I'm with you there. Cheese is great. Uh, Mark says, California, comfort food, Indian food, anything Indian. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Sega says, from Nepal, his comfort food is Momo. Sega, you're going to have to, maybe I should Google that. What's Momo? Let me see what Momo is. Um, I'll do Momo food and see what it shows me. Uh, it's a type of, okay, Tibetan Nepalese steamed full dumpling. Okay. That sounds very, very cool. Um, Mark says Indian is good. <laughs> um, Mark from Snohomish. I, still, I want to know where Snohomish is. I want to Google that as well today. And to expand my knowledge of the world. And it's foods. Okay, so it's a city in Washington State, Snohomish. Okay. Uh, Ilana says, I'm from Greece. My comfort food is eggs with fries. Nice. That's a nice one. Um, okay, great. Mike says, from Ohio, my comfort food is calzones. Calzones is something that I've heard of. Uh, it has something to do, it's like a pizza type thing, I think. Uh, yes, there we go. It's an Italian oven baked folded pizza. Okay, that's not a big thing here in South Africa, but that sounds that sounds very interesting. Um, Jean says, hi, everyone from Brazil, a good old burger. <laughs> I'm with you there, Jean. Burgers are always good. Burgers, burgers are my boys' go-to food. Uh, I've got two boys, age seven and 11. And if you ask them, uh, if, if we ever say we want to get some takeout or we want to have something comfortable, then they usually always go for burgers. Uh, my youngest is a chicken burger fan. Wherever we go for lunch, uh, if there's a chicken burger on the menu, then that's him. He's he's done and he's good and he's ready to go. Okay, excellent. I think everybody that is here is going is going to be here. Is here. I usually like to give five minutes for folks to join and, and have a bit of a, a chat. So lovely to meet you all today. I, I do see some familiar names there. Um, so today we are going to be working on developing for multi-site. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at the kind of considerations you need to make when you're developing a product for multi-site. Uh, we're talking specifically about themes and plugins today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when, when we were joining, it's, it's a topic that is difficult to cover everything in an hour and a half. So I'm going to do my best to give you an overview of the kind of things you need to be aware of and some tips and tricks of where to go looking for information. Uh, and, and we'll see if there are any questions that come out of all of that. Uh, before we get started, a few announcements. Uh, welcome again to everybody, and thank you to Thelma, who is co-hosting from Morocco today. The last time I spoke to her, she was in uh, somewhere in Europe, and then before that, she was back in Zimbabwe, and she gets all over the place. So uh, awesome to have you here with us today, Thelma. Thank you for co-hosting. 
Um, if anybody, if anybody can't see this slide, this announcement slide that's on screen right now, please let me know. Uh, there is a little bit of a bug sometimes where this, the screen share doesn't work 100%. So if at any time you can't see the screen, just let me know. And then what I do is I disable the screen share and I re-enable this. Uh, and then and then you should be able to see things. So if you can't see what's on my screen, please do give me a shout. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for letting me know there. And Mark as well. Um, okay. We are presenting in focus mode, which means Thelma and I can see your videos, but you can't see each other's. Uh, but you are welcome to... I feel like I've got a sneeze coming on. I hate it when this happens when I'm talking on, on a Zoom. Um, you are welcome to enable your video if you would like me and Thelma to see you, but you won't be able to see each other. And that's just pre to prevent any kind of Zoom bombing issues, which don't happen that much, but they do unfortunately still happen. Uh, you are welcome, as always, to ask questions. You're welcome to post questions in the chat or unmute to ask questions. Uh, Mark says, Jonathan and I go to the same barber. Yes, he's very good at what he does, uh, but he becomes costly over time. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, my my haircut is a new set of clippers every couple of years. That's my haircut cost. <laughs> uh, I'm too lazy to keep mine sharp and clean them, so I just buy a new set every every couple of years. Um, as I was saying, you are welcome to post questions in the chat. You're also welcome to unmute to ask questions. If you prefer to post them in the chat, but it's not quite clear to me, I might ask you to unmute to kind of clarify your question. Uh, if you prefer to unmute to ask a question, you're welcome to. You're welcome to just call my name and say, Jonathan, hold on, I've got a question. The only thing that I do ask is to please, if your question is not specifically related to what we're talking about today or on screen, maybe it's a, a slightly tangential question or related to something else, keep those either for the breaks that I leave or towards the end. But if it's about something on screen or something we're talking about, either I'm going too fast or you don't understand something that I'm presenting, then please feel free to stop me and let me know. Um, Okay, then just a, a quick sanity check again. I'm going to copy and paste the theme and plugin uh, repos that we're going to be working with today into the chat. Uh, as I mentioned, the theme is a child theme of 2023, which is the current default theme for WordPress. So you will need that theme in your uh, WordPress multi-site setup. Uh, you will need a multi-site setup. So unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to go through setting up a multi-site again today. Uh, but if you are watching this uh, later on and you have never set up a multi-site install, there is a workshop on WordPress.tv that I did a couple of weeks ago that walks you through that process. So if you don't have a multi-site today, go through that video, go find that video on, on WordPress.tv, set up a multi-site locally, and then you can work through today's content. Um, then very importantly, I do tend to talk very, very fast. Uh, it's something I very much try and focus on, especially given what I do. But if I start going too fast and either you can't understand me or the automated captions are not keeping up, please do let me know. Um, send me a message in the chat or just say, hey, Jonathan, slow down. Um, as always, we will, I will be posting this recording. This is being recorded and will be posted to WordPress TV afterwards, usually during the course of my day tomorrow. And then finally, if you're looking for any more content around uh, learning things about WordPress, you can go to learn.wordpress.org. Um, all of the workshops that I'm doing Mostly this year, I am turning into tutorials on Learn WordPress. So if you don't want to sit through the workshop, you can go and watch the tutorial as well and all the code samples and snippets and all of that are there as well. Okay. Then let's just look at our out learning outcomes for today. Um, I'm going to be looking at some useful resources to be aware of if you're developing for a multi-site setup. Um, I've actually gone and gone through and, and listed sort of some of the main functions you might need to work with, some of the main hooks and filters you might need to be aware of. Um, so if you, I actually just remember today that it might be useful to also share the link to the slides in the chat uh, because all the functions are in the useful resources slide. So that'll be handy if anybody wants to download that. Um, then we'll be looking at what to consider when developing a theme or a child theme and if it's going to be used on a multi-site network. And then what to consider when developing plugins that might get used on a multi-site network. So those are the three main topics today that we're going to be covering. Okay, before we kick off, uh, are there any questions around anything? Does anybody need time to get anything set up, grab a sip of water, take a break, whatever the case may be? I am going to go off camera and blow my nose because there is a sneeze that's building. So I apologize, I'm gonna unmute and go off camera for a second while I do that. Um, Uh, 
I realized there I was talking after I muted myself. So that was daft. <laughs> Can you tell I haven't done these in about two weeks? Okay. Um, we don't have any questions, so let's let's kick off. Um, so the first thing I want to just cover is some sort of thoughts to think about when it comes to developing for multi-site. Um, and to give you a little bit of background history, the first time I encountered the concept of multi-site, I, I had started developing plugins for WordPress. This was around 2016. I had used WordPress in the past. I had built sites for clients with WordPress. I had uh, built custom solutions for WordPress installs at the companies I'd worked for. I'd built themes based on designs. But at that point, I'd never discovered multi-site. It was never something that sort of, you know, came up in my requirements. Um, and then I started building plugins to sell. Uh, and my, the first plugin that I built was for a very specific theme. And it was a plugin that enabled the, 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 the owner of the plugin to install this on a site that had this theme installed and effectively white label the theme. So it removed any specific branding of the theme branding and replaced it with your own name. And there was an icon that you replace. And it sort of made the theme look like it was a custom developed theme as opposed to belonging to a theme company. And on the way in the process of selling this plugin to, to clients, one support request I would get a lot of is, is this plugin multi-site supported? In other words, if I install it on a multi-site network with this theme installed, will it work? Um, and I didn't even think of that. I knew what multi-site was. I knew roughly how it worked, but I didn't think about the effect of developing a custom plugin for a multi-site network might need to, to worry about. Um, and so I went and did a bit of research into you know, developing for multi-site. And the first thing that I discovered is that a lot of the knowledge around developing for a multi-site network is largely undocumented. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you go to, I'm just going to uh, hide something which is in my way here, um, that one. If you go to the developer documentation of developer.wordpress.org, first of all, there is nothing on this homepage that even talks about multi-site as a concept. Um, if you open, let me let me share this link in case anybody wants to open this on their side. If you open, for example, the code reference, uh, the code reference is effectively, you can filter by functions, hooks, classes, and methods, but there's nothing in there that you can say, just show me the functions and hooks and methods and classes that are multi-site specific. Uh, so you can't really find too much information there. Um, if you have a look at your common APIs, that, that's somewhere where you might think something about multi-site would exist. There's nothing in the menu that, um, that talks about multi-site. Uh, Mike, before you go, it'll be shared uh, tomorrow, sometime during my day tomorrow. I share the link in the meetup event comments, and then you can also find it on WordPress TV, wordpress.tv, and it'll be the same name as what today's uh, session is. So, so keep an eye out for it there. Um, so there's nothing in the common APIs about, about multi-site. If you have a look at developing plugins, for example, the plugin developer handbook, um, there's no menu item. If you look on the left here, there's nothing related to developing for multi-site there. Uh, and the same goes for the theme developer handbook. There's nothing specifically there. Let me open that up in a new tab. There's nothing specifically there about developing for multi-site. So it's something that you kind of have to figure out on your own. You have to kind of stumble across it. Um, I'm hoping today that I will be able to give you some of the sort of knowledge around what to think about when you're developing a plugin or theme for a multi-site network um, and, and help you dive into the areas that you need to go looking for information on. Um, so the first thing that I would recommend, and I'm going to open up my, my Visual Stu uh, Code Studio now, is there is a, in the WP admin folder of a WordPress install, there is a network directory. And the network directory is effectively all of the admin functionality that powers the multi-site part of the network. Um, so if you are, I'm going to switch over to my multi-site network quickly here. So this is my multi-site dashboard. Um, and I've got sites, users, themes, plugin settings, and all of this functionality. This all pretty much exists inside of the files, inside of the network directory, inside of WP Admin. So a lot of the, the, the information that you can find out about multi-site, what are the action hooks and filter hooks that are firing in the, in the dashboard, you'll be able to find in these files. Um, 
And so one of the things that I did yesterday was I just did a search. Let me find a good example. I'm going to open up the edit.php page. I just did a search for any do action calls, uh, which then helped me list out all of the all of the um, action hooks that are being fired in the in the network admin dashboard. So that's one way to kind of dive into multi-site and see what are the kind of things that are available there. When it comes to the front end, um, I, I thought I had a, a note here about that, but I don't. When it comes to the front end, it's not that easy to find information. But the one thing that you can do, and we'll, we'll discuss this function in a second, is if you do a search through the WordPress code base, uh, I'm going to do a search here now for the is multi-site function. So is multi-site is a very simple function that just checks, is this a multi-site network? And if it is, returns true. And if it's not, returns false. And then you go through and you look for all the places where is multi-site is being used. You can find the specific functionality that is being run or not run, depending on if it's a multi-site network. So for example, if we have a look at the wp-activate.php file, which is the one I have open right now, um, this resides in the... Um, it just resides in the root of your WordPress install. Um, okay, someone says they can't see the screen. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Let me just disable screen share and then re-enable it and that should fix the problem. Um, if I can get my, one second everybody, if I can just get my Zoom panels back. Um, there we go. <laughs> There's a specific button that I have to click. So let me, uh, let me share that. Okay, let's go to stop share, right? We're stopping the share now. And let's go share screen and let's go desktop one. There we go. Okay, my screen share sh is now loading. Um, right, so now Ilana, can you see my, my code editor window now? Um, You just let us know in the chat if you can see that code editor screen. Um, okay, Mike says the screen share looks good. Ilana, if you can just confirm that for us. Uh, sorry, not Mike, Mark. <laughs> okay, excellent, great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, that was that bug I told you about. Sometimes when folks join after I've shared the screen, it doesn't work 100% and I just need to re-enable it. So, so we're back to that now. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so we were talking about, let me hide this window again. Um, yeah, um, so this is the wp-activate.php file. It sits in the root of a WordPress install. It's sort of the first PHP file uh, at the top of that list. Um, and you will see there is the is multi-site function being called. It's doing a is not multi-site. So in other words, if this is not a multi-site install, then it does some specific functionality. Um, and so that's a great way to check what things are happening in a multi-site environment versus not in a multi-site environment. Um, unfortunately, that does require you to do a little bit of work on your side, but there's a, there, there's a, that's a good way to sort of go through the WordPress code base and see what is specifically multi-site and what is specifically not. Okay, so that's one way that you can go about it. Let's go back to my slides. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is only so much that I can cover in a one and a half hour workshop. So I'm gonna try and cover some sort of top level items, but it does require you to do a little bit more sort of research if you are developing specifically for a multi-site install. Uh, and those are two ways you can do it, either looking in that, that network folder. So let's just go back there. So that was in the WP admin network directory and just seeing what files are there and what they're doing or to search for any instances of the is multi-site function in a WordPress install and go through those. Um, then last but not least, if you want to know if your plugin or theme works on a multi-site network, make sure you can set up a multi-site network locally and test, 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 test. So install the theme, install the plugin, make sure it does what you expect it to do, set up a couple of, of local subsites using the subdomain, uh, sorry, the subdirectory install, which will be the easiest option and test does the plugin functionality work, does the theme functionality work, does it do what it needs to do? Okay. Any questions on all of that before we dive into some useful functions and things that are good to be aware of? While I take a sip of coffee. Mm. 
while we talk about coffee, I have the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to Greece in June to go to WordCamp Europe, and I can't wait to try Greek coffee. I believe it's very, very good. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some useful multi-site related functions. Um, I'm going to make, I realize that this text on these is quite small, so I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, if I can, if I can navigate my own slides, <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, let's make it 26. There we go. Okay. Um, so the first one is, uh, what have I done? I've just, sorry, folks, I am busy breaking my own Zoom setup. So the first one is the is multi-site function. Uh, I'm not going to open up the handbook docs. They are linked in the slides if you want to check them out later. We're just going to run through them very quickly. But the is multi-site function we've already discussed. It basically checks, is this a multi-site network? And if it is, perform certain functionality. And if it isn't, don't. So that's a great way you can develop your plugin or theme to have specific functionality for a multi-site network. Um, then there is the is main site function. So what this does is this checks, as you might remember, when we installed the multi-site, there's always the main site, which is the first site that existed as a single site before it was converted into a multi-site. That function just returns again, true or false, if you're in the main site or not. Then you have two uh, admin related functions. There's the is super admin function, which is the multi-site equivalent of the is admin function. Um, and you'll know that that basically checks Sorry, not, not, sorry, I'm getting myself confused here. Sorry, the is network admin function is the multi-site equivalent of the is admin function, which checks are you, is the request being made in the dashboard or is it a front end request? Um, so the is network admin function, which is the fourth one on this list, basically says, are we in the network dashboard? And if we are, then perform certain functionality or don't. Um, the is super admin function is specific to the current user so you can check if the current user is the super admin, in other words, the network admin, the person who set up the multi-site or somebody who's been assigned network admin, and then you can allow specific functionality or not depending on that user. Um, and the network admin URL is the multi-site equivalent of the admin URL function, which is a function that you can use to retrieve the network admin URL and then append variables to it to redirect folks through the network. So when I talk about the network admin URL, let me, let me show you what I mean. Um, it's, it's effectively, it's this URL here. So in this case, it'll be multipress.test slash WP admin slash network. Um, and if you want to redirect somebody to a page within the network, not within the dash the admin dashboard for the single site, that's the network admin URL that you would use. Then you've got things like get blogs of user. Um, and you'll notice when we look at some of these functions, some of them use the keyword or the term site. Some of them use the keyword or the term block. Uh, and that's just a sort of offshoot of the fact that WordPress was orig originally a blogging platform. So what we know as sites today used to be known as blogs. So some of them are still using the old terminology of a blog. But effectively, the get blogs of user is a function that will return all of the sites, the subsites, or the, even the main site on the network that this user has access to or is an admin of. Uh, so if you have a user that is an admin across multiple sites and you need to perform certain functionality across those sites because of the user, you can use the get blogs of user um, functionality. The last one is the is network only plugin function. Now, this one is very specific to plugin um, developers. And I'm going to open this one because it actually exposes something extra that I want to share with you. Um, you'll see that at the top here, it says it checks for the network true in the plugin header. So what this means is when you're developing, I'm gonna switch back over to my code editor view here. When you're developing a plugin, um, as, we, as we know, no, not a Kismet, let's open up Hello Dolly, for example. As we know, plugins have a plugin header. Sorry, here it is, where you can define the plugin name, the plugin URI, the description, the author, the version, those kind of things. You can also specify a network key and you can set it to true. Um, and what this effectively does, let me go back to the documentation, uh, is, it, is it allows the plugin to only be activated as a network plugin. So in other words, somebody installing it on a single site wouldn't be able to activate it on a single site. It's specifically network only. So that's great if you want to develop a plugin that specifically adds network functionality to, to a multi-site network. Um, that's kind of a way that you can prevent that from happening. And this, this check basically checks for that header and returns true or false based on that. Okay, other functions that are useful? Uh, we've got the gets. So these are a few that I'm gonna mention all at the same time. Yes. I don't know if you've seen 
Felicia's question, or maybe I missed that. Uh, oh, Felicia's question. No, I didn't see that. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Um, Felicia says, do you, why do you prefer subdomains to subfolders? Oh, um, Felicia, that was just a reference to when you're setting up a local um, testing multi-site. Uh, I mentioned that in the in the setting up a multi-site workshop that unless you have, uh, it's not a preference of mine, it's just unless you have a um, a local domain, a local wildcard domain set up with domain mapping, you won't be able to set up a subdomain on a local development environment, so on your PC, uh, on your computer. So it's just easier to set up a subdirectory. Uh, so it wasn't really my preference, it was just the, the sort of limitation of how domains work and subdomains with a multi-site network. Um, and I see Alana says it's nothing like American coffee. So <laughs> that's interesting. Okay, great. We're all on board with that. Okay. So then the next set of functions that I want to chat to you about kind of all work together. So there's the, I'm going to run through them and then I'm going to explain how they work. So there's the get sites function, which you can kind of already think about what that might do. Then there's the switch to blog function. See, we see now site versus blog. So think about site and blog as the same thing. Just bear that in mind. The restore current blog uh, function. Then there's the update blog option function and the get current blog ID function. Okay. So get sites effectively will get a list of all the sites on the network. So it returns a list, an array of all the sites and you can get their IDs and that kind of thing. Switch to blog effectively what that does is it switches the scope of the current site that you're accessing to a different site. So what do I mean by that? When you are, because because your multi-site shares the same WordPress core files and the same plugin files, so it's not multiple plugin files, it's one plugin that works across different sites. You, you, act, you network activate it and then you, and then you individually activate the plugin on the different sites. Because that's shared across the network, when you are in one of the subsites, for example, if your plugin is querying the posts, then it's only going to get the posts in the scope of that site. If you are updating options, it's only going to update the options for that site. Um, but you might want to be able to switch to a different site and maybe pull data from that site or update an option in that site for whatever reason. Um, that's where the switch to blog function comes in. So you can switch the, the scope of what site you're in, in your plugin or in your theme code to a different site on the network, perform some, some functionality there, and then use restore current blog to switch back to the current site. Uh, so I want to give you an example of what something like that might look like. Um, one example I have is, let's say you are in a plugin and you want to create a function that updates an option on a specific site on the network. So you've got some functionality happening and on a certain trigger, you want to call a function that, let's say, updates an option on site two, for example. Um, so I'm going to open up my, my VS code now and just uh, at the bottom of Hello Dolly here, I'm just going to scroll to the bottom and kind of show you what a function like that might look like using some of these functions we've just discussed. And I'm just going to copy and paste it and pop it on screen so you can all see it. I will also share it in the chat if you want to copy that code. But effectively, here's the function. It's called update site option, and we pass it the site ID. And then we say switch to blog, and we pass in the site ID. So that means change the scope to whatever site we're changing. Then we can run the default update option function call, which many plugin developers will know. If you don't know, it's basically just updates an option. And we tell it the option we want to update and the new value, and it'll then update that option for that site. And then we call the record, call, restore current blog function to restore back to the existing blog that we were on. So if we were on site three, for example, and we wanted to update an option on site two, we could call update site option, pass in the number two, and then it'll make that change as necessary for site two, and then come back to the current scope. If you don't come back to the current scope, any other execution of your code will take place on the site that you switched to, and that co could cause issues. So if you read the documentation for switch to blog, it says you should always restore current blog when you've switched to blog and made the changes that you need to make. Now, let's say, for example, you wanted to extend this function and you wanted to, for example, update an option across all sites based on some trigger. Let's say, for example, you've got a piece of admin functionality. And when a super network admin, say, enters some information and hits submit, they want that information to go across all sites in the network. Well, then your function might look a little bit different. It might look something like this. So let me talk you through that. Um, 
So here we're passing in the option name and option value, which we'll get maybe from the form or whatever the case may be. And then we're calling the get sites function. So this is similar to get posts. Get post goes and retrieves all the posts for a site. Get sites retrieves all the sites on the network. Then it's, a, it's an array of sites. You can loop through that array and get each individual site. Each individual site in that array is an object. So you use the object notation to get the blog ID from the site object. So you switch to that site using switch to blog. You run the update, the single update option, because now we're in the scope of that site. So we don't have to use the, um, the, 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 the blog option one, which I'll show you in a second. We use the single update option, the new option and value, which I should actually be using these variables. So let's do that. Um, slight change in my code here. This is what happens when you when you write example code that you never test. It's just meant to be an example. Um, and then again, restore current blog. Now, what I would like to, to highlight to you here is that I'm calling restore current blog inside of the loop. Because if I did this, if I switch to blog and I called restore current blog outside of the loop, restore current blog only restores the previously switched to site. So let me give you an example. Let's say I've got five sites on the network. My main site is site one, and then I've got site two, three, four, and five. I will get the sites. So I'll get all the different sites. I'll start with site one. So I'll switch to site one and I'll make the change. Then I'll switch to site two and I'll make the change to three to four. Then I, then I was on five and the last one was four. So when I call restore current blog here, it'll restore back to four, not back to the previous one I wanted to be on. So you should always call restore current blog inside of here and that way it'll always restore back the correct one and get you to the same place um, the other way that you can do it and this is another function in the list so let me switch back to my slides is you can use the get current blog id and store the current blog that you're on so let's say you're actually accessing this in in, in site id four for example and you want to always make sure you switch back to the scope of four so get current blog id obviously gets the current site id or blog ID. That's always the confusion when things are different. So here, for example, you could say something like this. You could say current site ID equals get current blog ID. So that'll be whatever the current site is. Then you can do your get sites. You can loop through and do the updates. And then um, over here, right after the for each loop, then you can call switch to blog again and pass in what the current site ID was. And that way, you know you're always coming back to your current site. Now, what's interesting about this is I was doing some research on this while I was preparing for this workshop. And apparently, doing it this way is more performant. And let's think about that. In the, 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 the previous way, we were doing switch to blog, update option, and restore to current blog. So those are three actions. So multiply that by five sites, that's 15 actions in total. Now what are we doing? We're doing two actions inside of the loop. So that means 10 actions, and then one action to switch back to the current blog and one action to get the current blog ID. So now we've gone from 15 to 12, which is only three less, but imagine that on scale. Imagine that on 100 sites. So you would have gone from 100 times three actions, 300 actions, down to 100 times two, 200 plus two, so 202. So that's a 92 action decrease meaning your, your processing is that much faster, almost a third faster. So depending on your scope and how you're running things and how you're making changes, it's good to know both options exist. Okay, uh, Jan says, is there a way to add new fields when generating a new site? I'm glad you asked that. Um, Jan, I'm going to get to that in a second, so bear with me on that one. Uh, Lisa asks, are you using Notepad++? No, Lisa, I use, so I use two editors. I'll share them with you very quickly. Uh, the first one is VS Code, uh, and that is the one that I use in my in my workshops. Um, and the reason I use it is because it is free, it is open source, and in most people can down can download it and use it. And it's also possible to set it up with a lot of functionality that my actual everyday uh, editor uses, which is called PHP Storm. Um, PHP Storm is a paid for IDE that I, I'm actually going to bring it over here. I use it for my writing, for my coding. Um, and it has a lot of built-in PHP functionality that I like. I'm going to share this with you today because I can't do this in, in VS Code yet because I don't know how. But for example, in PHP Storm, uh, this is completely unrelated to multi-site. I want to just share this with folks. One of the things I love about PHP Storm is you can do a find in files search. 
and you can search for, remember we were talking about searching for is multi-site earlier. So I can do that. I can say is multi-site. I can search for it. And then I can do what's known as open in find window. And when I do that, it pops up a find window at the bottom of my screen. And it shows me the list of all the, the results. And I can literally just click through to every single one and see the code on the right-hand side here. Um, so this is a great way of digging into multi-site and seeing where all those instances are. I, I, I'm pretty sure it probably is possible in VS Code. It probably would requ require a plugin of some kind. Um, but because it's by default in PHP Storm, I just keep using it in PHP Storm. So those are the two editors I use, VS Code for my workshops and PHP Storm for my day-to-day. -day. Okay. Um, so, so that's how you would use get site, switch to blog, restore current blog, update blog, all that kind of thing. Um, so oh, let's let's dive into the Sega says, right click on folder, you want to search and select find in folder. So let's do that. So let's go. So the so the problem with that, Sega, is I can't do that on the folder that I have open, which is where I want to do the searching. Um, let's let's do it. So we can do uh, uh, find in folder. So there we can do is multi-site. So it gives us the same functionality, but I can't do it on the top level. So if you can tell me how to do it on the top level, that would also be cool. Um, but I'm inside, for example, the multi-press folder, and I don't see a way, there's no way to, to search in the multi-press folder. Uh, so let me know if you know how to do that one. Okay. Um, then, um, use the sidebar search. Yeah, I've, that, that's, that's the one I think that I was using. That's this one, yes. So that's the sidebar search, yeah. Okay um where were we so yan had the question that's right yan had the question about uh where are we now where are my slides there we go yan said um is there a way to add new fields when generating a new site and i'm glad you mentioned that because there is a way so there are also some useful multi-site related hooks that i recommend you look into um and the one yan specifically to your question is there is a sign up blog form hook which let me open up that one quickly. Uh, this fires after the site signup form. So you can add additional fields to that signup form. And then there is the WP initialized site. So this time they've gone from blog to site again, um, which fires when the site's initialization rune sh rune routine should be executed. So you can set up uh, additional fields on the signup form. And then inside this action, this initialized site action, you can do something with those fields. Uh, and a great example for that is, for example, if you wanted to allow multi-site users that are signing up to select their own domain name uh, and have some kind of API request that registers it for them and then points it to their subsite, that would be the perfect place to do it. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to dive into how one would do that today. That's that's maybe a whole other workshop or a live stream, but that is an example of how you could how you could do that. Um, then other useful related hooks, there's the network admin menu hook, which is essentially the hook you use when you want to register network admin menu items. Uh, that's the same as the single site admin menu hook. There is a network admin notices hook, which is the equivalent of the single site admin notices hook to register admin notices. We've spoken about the blog form and the initialized site. There's also a, and here you'll see the WPMU prefix. So if you, if you go and read about the history of WordPress, WordPress multi-site was originally developed as a project called WPMU, uh, so WordPress multi-user. And some of those functions had the WPMU prefix, and some of those functions still contain that prefix. Um, but what that does is it filters the displayed, let me move this out the way, actually, let me hide it. Um, sorry, folks. It filters the displayed site columns in the site list table. So what that means is if I go to my site list, uh, I can add columns to this table using that, that filter. Um, and then there's the manage sites custom column, which allows me to um, fire for each registered custom column in the table. So if I register columns to the table, I can use that and I can do certain things on it. Um, so there are these functionalities and these hooks and filters that you can use that you can dive into. There are a whole bunch more. Um, I can't list them out today, unfortunately. But if you look through that network directory in the WP admin, you will see and you will find most of the hooks there. And there's quite a few available to change how the admin works, how to register admin menus, um, how to do specific things in the network admin, and then what to do when you're working on in your, in your plugins and in your themes. Okay, so those are the ones that I wanted to highlight today. Uh, are there any questions around any of what we've just covered? Um, 
any of the example code we just looked at. Otherwise, we're going to start diving into specifically what to think about when talking about plugins and what to think about when talking about themes. While we're doing that, I'm going to close down some of these tabs that I have open because otherwise I get myself lost. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that I want to chat about, and I'm going to switch off from the slides now because now I'm going to work from, from my notes and from some coding. The first thing I want to chat about is themes. So if you want to see how this works along with me, um, I already have the 2023 child installed as the network admin. I have already network enabled it. If we go to the code for this child theme, you'll see that it doesn't do anything very special. So I'm going to open up the 2023 child. Um, it just has, it's, it's, it's a block theme. So it's based on the 2023 theme. So it has a basic theme.json file. It has a style.css, which just has the theme header. It has a pretty standard readme. It has an empty functions.php file. And then it has very specifically a footer default pattern that I've copied from the parent theme to the child theme. Um, and that's what we're going to be working with today. So when it comes to how themes and child themes and that work across the network, the, the, the shortened version of it is most of your functionality will just work as is. So if you are calling template tags to get site names, and if you're calling uh, post related query, uh, querying posts, querying pages, querying whatever, updating and deleting site options, all those kind of things, that's going to remain pretty much the same. Um, the only time that you, sorry, I'm just gonna pop my notes back over here so I can see what I'm talking about. The only time that you might need to worry about whether or not the theme runs on multi-site or not, is if you wanted to specifically get some information about the sites across the network and include it in a specific site. So let me show you a rather simplified example. Let's say that in my child theme, when I have the child theme installed, instead of the, uh, so let's have a look at what this looks like on the front end. Uh, so I'm going to go to my multipress site and I'm just gonna visit the site. Um, and if we have a look at the footer, right at the bottom here, it just says proudly powered by WordPress. And let's say as a very simplified example, I want my sites on the network to say proudly powered by the site name uh, for whatever reason, that's my simple use case. So what I would typically then do is I would go into my, in this case, my block theme pattern for the footer, and I would simply change the code over here. So I would change this to do something. Uh, so it's this, this uh, anchor tag. I'm just going to take that all out over there. Um, and here I could just get the site name uh, using a function called get blog info. So I could do something like this, get blog info. It's a, it's a WordPress function and I can just pass in the value name and that will then get the name of the site in question. Um, sorry, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, and, and once I've done that, it's going to get the name of this current site and display it in the footer. So let's test that. So if I switch back to my multipress site, I'm seeing I'm on multipress.test, which is the main site and I do a refresh and there it is powered by multipress. So I'm happy that that works. Then I switch to my uh, my other site and I've got Bob set up again. I tend to use Bob as a default. So I apologize to any Bobs in the in the in the chat. Um, and if I visit that site, so I'm going to just visit that site from here. I'm going to open this in a new tab, uh, and I scroll to the bottom. There, it's proudly powered by Bob Press. So that's working the way I need it to work. Great. Happy days. Move on with my life. So that just works as per normal. I didn't have to tell. Uh, the blog info function that it was on a multi-site network. Um, it just, it does what it needs to do because it knows the scope that it's in. However, let's say that I'm building a network of sites and I want folks to know that this site is part of a larger network. So maybe it's a university site or it's a nonprofit site. And what I would rather this thing say is proudly powered by the site name and then in brackets, part of the multi-press network, for example. I would now need to build some kind of functionality to do that. So let's dive into what that might look like. So I always like to keep these in a function. So I'm gonna call this TT so 2023C. So TT3C for 2023 child. Uh, I forgot the function 
prefix at the front there. So TG3C for the 2023 child is the prefix. And I'm going to say get site name. That's going to be the name of my function. Uh, and I should also check if this function has or hasn't been defined somewhere else in case another plugin or theme defines this function. Uh, the chances of it are very small, but it's a good idea to prevent any kind of errors or bugs or whatever. So a good practice is to say, if not uh, function exists, and then I pass in the function name. You may have seen this many times on plugins or themes uh, within the WordPress space. So I would make sure that only if the function doesn't exist, then I want to create my custom function. Uh, cool. So now in here, the first thing I'm going to use is I'm going to use the current site name. So this get login phone name. So we could say current site is get login phone name. Perfect. So that'll give us whatever the current site name is. But now I also want to get the main site name. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. But if you remember, we spoke earlier about using, let me go back to the slides. We spoke about the get sites option. We spoke about the switch to blog option. We spoke about the restore current blog option. So we know we can use that functionality. So because I always want to get the main site name, I can essentially then go uh, switch to blog. And I pass in the ID of one because the first site is generally always ID of one unless something's gone wrong somewhere. Um, now, how you could get that if it wasn't the main site, that's a different example, but let's just go with the fact that it is set up as the main site. So then I would get that site's name. So I could say main site name. And here I can just call get blog info again. Um, and that's because we have switched to that scope. So when I recall, when I call get blog info name in the scope of site one, it'll get the name of site one. And then we need to restore. So we restore current blog, which restores back to whatever our current site is. And that's effectively the function. So I'm getting the main name for the site, switching to the, to the first site, getting the name there, switching back to the current site. Now I need to return some information. So what I can do here is I can say echo um, current site, and then I can append a string and I can say something like part of the, and then I can append that to the main site name and then append another string and say network, close the brackets. And don't forget the semicolon. And there we go. And that's what our function in our functions.php file would look like. I'm pasting it in the chat if anybody wants to grab that. Um, and then in the footer, we can just call this function. So I actually think I need to return, not, sorry, I need to return, not echo. Apologies. Let's return. Echo means output to the screen. I want to return it, not echo it. So let me update that function in the chat. So there's that. There's our get site name. And now it's going to go and it's going to call that function, switch to the main site, get the name, append the string, and return it back. So let's see what that's going to look like on the front end. So let me open up both sites. So let's visit both multi, multi press and Bob press. So if we open multi press and we scroll to the bottom, there we go. Proudly powered by MultiPress, which is part of the MultiPress network, which is what we want. Um, or is it? Um, and then for BobPress, it says proudly powered by BobPress, which is part of the multi-site network. Now, here's a good example. Do we want the main site to be powered by MultiPress, which is part of the MultiPress network? Maybe we don't. Maybe we only want this to show on subsites. So that's where, for example, we can use, and we mentioned this earlier, we can use this is main site function. So this one checks if it's on the main site or not. So we can update this code. So let's go back to our functions.php. And at the right of the top here, we can say, if this is the main site, well, then we just want to return the get blog info name. We don't need the powered by and all of that. Uh, it is the main site. So we just return that powered by MultiPress. Or we could say powered by the MultiPress network or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's that. Otherwise, if it isn't the multi-site, then do what it needs to do, build up the name and, and return it. So with that in place, let's, out, let's have a look at what that does. So multi-press, if we refresh the home page, just proudly, proudly powered by multi-press, we could add the multi-press network or whatever we wanted there. And then on Bob Press, we have the 
proudly powered by Bob Press, part of the multi-site network, multi-press network. So that's the only time you might need to use some of this functionality is if you want specific information from the different sites in the network because you want to render it somewhere in your content. Uh, if you're wanting to pull posts from another site into a main site, I remember one of the early ideas that I had, I had a couple of blogs that I was running. One was to do with development. One was a personal blog. One was to do with the sport that I was doing at the time. And I thought about building a multi-site network for each one of those blogs and then pulling them all into the main site, which was kind of like the home for everything and then having it split off. Um, ultimately, I scrapped all of that and just ended up putting it all on one blog anyway. Uh, but that's one way you could do it. You could have one main site that has all the data and then all the subsites you could have individual information there. But otherwise, as I was saying, the rest of your plugin and theme functionality, you don't have to make any huge changes. You don't have to make any major considerations. Your plugins and themes will just work. Sorry, your plugins and themes. Your themes and your child themes will just work as they normally are on a site because they know that they're in the scope of that specific site. Okay. Any questions around developing themes for a multi-site network um, before we before we move on? I'm just going to make a note of that multi-press update because I didn't think of it until we literally did it now in the workshop. Um, so I'm going to grab that code and update my notes so that when I record the tutorial for this, we can we can include that as well, because it's a nice little way to look at it. Um, okay. Right, there don't seem to be any questions around, around themes, so let's move on to plugins. So the plugin that I have installed, let's switch back to uh, my site admin. The plugin that I have installed, if you joined me for my Learn Plugin Security Workshop, uh, you will remember that this is a plugin that sets up a short code that renders a form and then saves form submissions into a database. I'm going to very quickly look at the code so we can understand and remind ourselves what the code does. Uh, I'm not going to dive into the actual functionality today, but essentially it has these success and error pages. Uh, there's an activation hook which creates a custom table called form submissions. Uh, there's some JavaScript that happens that does things. Uh, there's a short code which renders the form and then users can submit the form and it's like a contact form for a website. Uh, and I used this when I did the plugin security workshop and we sort of spoke about how you should sanitize data and all those kind of things. Don't worry too much about the actual functionality. The thing to remember when it comes to developing plugins and themes is, sorry, I keep saying plugins and themes. When it comes to developing plugins specifically, like themes, most plugin functionality will work the same in a single site and on a multi-site. So again, if you're doing things like register post type, get posts, update options, all those kind of things on a single site environment will work in a multi-site because it is in the scope of that site. There are, however, two things to think about when developing a plugin. The first is that plugins will often have some kind of settings page. So you will have to register an admin menu item and maybe an admin submenu. And then you'll have some kind of page, you'll have some function that registers the callback. So example, if we look at this, if we look at this plugin, I'm gonna go down to the bottom, there's an admin menu hook that I've hooked into, and it adds the learn admin page submenu. And then it renders, it renders a, a list of the submissions. Now, when you're developing your plugin for the multi-site network, you need to think about, does the settings page need to exist in the single sites admin, as well as or exclusively to the network admin. If it's a setting that is going to affect the entire network, then it needs to belong to the network admin and you need to register it using the uh, network admin menu hook and, and do things accordingly. The rest of the functionality will be pretty much the same, uh, but you need to register it in the right hook. And then the other thing that you need to think about is how your notices work. So if you're running admin notices, you need to use the network admin notices if you're updating things, changing things, whatever the case may be. That's the one consideration. The other consideration is if your plugin is storing any kind of custom information. So in other words, you're not using custom post types. You're using, like we are in this instance, we're using a custom table. So let me show you what I mean when I talk about this. If we go and have a look at the uh, activation hook, 
you will see that I'm using the WPDB prefix method on the WPDB object to create the form submissions table name. When I activate this plugin, uh, I'm going to just deactivate it and then reactivate it. When I activate this plugin, when I network activate this plugin, the register activation hook will fire because that's when the plugin is activated on the network. So it doesn't fire when I activate the plugin on a single site, it fires when I activate it on the network. So if I switch over to my database for the site, um, let me show you that very quickly. I'm going to go here to multipress. You will see that it's created the WP underscore form underscore submissions table, which is great. The problem is, if I load the shortcode onto one of the subsites, because, and let's scroll down to the function that saves the form data. So we'll go down here to maybe, the, it's the maybe process form function. And you'll see here, I'm getting the table name as prefix form submissions. Remember what I said earlier, your, your core functionality will function in the scope of the site. So in the scope of site two, WPDB prefix will return WP underscore two underscore, and then you're appending form submissions to it. So it's going to look for a table that doesn't currently exist. Let me show you in the database. I've got WP2 terms and term meta and posts and options and links and comments, but I don't have a form submissions. So because I'm using the core pre table prefix functionality of WordPress, which I should do, it's getting the table name that belongs to site two, which is WPDB underscore two, and looking for form submissions, it's not going to find it and that code is going to fail. So I, as a plugin developer, need to be aware of that. Now, there are two ways that I can do this. Either I can update my, my process to always use the WP underscore form submissions table or use my own custom prefix. So I might, reg I might use a prefix of... Uh, LPS for learn plugin security or whatever the case may be. Um, the problem with doing it that way is it's not sort of the WordPress way, if you will, and it could cause you problems later on. So if you have a look at the, let's find the register activation hook uh, documentation in the WordPress developer docs. Uh, I want to show you something to think about there. So I'm going to share this with you if you want to scroll with me. And if we scroll down to the uh, user, the user uh, contributed notes, they call it. Uh, and you'll go down a little bit, a little bit, a little bit here. And I, this is what I was looking through when I was preparing for this. Uh, there's a, con a, a comment here by Mallory DXW old six years ago. Uh, I'm going to actually just copy that link uh, and paste it in the chat so you can jump straight to that. And it says there, according to Nason, a lead developer for WordPress, you shouldn't use activation hooks, especially on multi-site. Instead, you should do, and there's a whole thing. And if you click through to the core ticket, you can see the discussion and what they were talking about there. Effectively, the comment below that answers the question. In a multi-site network, there is an argument called network-wide. Well, sorry, not in a multi-site network. In any WordPress install, there is an argument called network-wide, which is passed to the callback function for an activation hook. In the scope of a multi-site network, that network-wide argument is always going to be true. So you can use that to perform specific functionality for your activation in your plugin if you're on a multi-site network versus not. So you'll see what they're doing here is they're getting the sites, looping through the sites, running the my plugin install site custom functionality, restoring the current blog, and then continuing along from there. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how I need to change my plugin code to work with this information. So let's go back over here and have a look at the activation hook. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take the code that creates the table and I'm going to put it in a separate function just so that I can keep that code separate. So I'm going to take all of this in the learn setup table and I'm going to create a new function called WP learn create table. I could call it create form table. I could call it create whatever I want. And I'm going to put that code in there because this code stays the same no matter what site scope I'm in. I want that to stay the same. 
use the prefix correctly, create the form submissions table. Perfect. Then inside of the activation hook, because I've copied this code out, I, I can delete this now. And inside of my callback, I'm gonna pass in the network wide argument. I don't have to call it network wide, but it makes it easier if I do. And then I can say if network wide, in other words, if this is being activated on a network. What I can also do to kind of make my life a little bit easier is I can also do a check before this to say if is multi-site and network wide. So this way it'll do the multi-site check first. If that fails, it'll carry on like it's a single site. If it is a multi-site, it'll check is this plugin being activated network wide. In other words, in the network admin dashboard, I'm network activating it. And then in that case, what am I gonna do? First of all, I'm gonna get my sites. And if you remember, we did this in Hello Dolly earlier. So what did we? No, we didn't do it there. Yes, we did. So it's sites equals get sites. You can use the get sites function to get all the sites. And then we're gonna say for each sites as, using the wrong keys today, <laughs> for each sites as sites, I wanna loop through the sites. Then I'm going to switch to the site, switch to blog. <laughs> Passing in, and I think it was blog ID. Yeah, there we go. And then once I've switched to the content of that site, I want to create the table. So then I can call the WP Learn Create Table function. There we go. Once I've done that, what do I need to do? I need to restore. So restore current blog or do it the other way that I mentioned. As we know, there's multiple ways to do it. I'm just going to stick with this one for now. Um, and that'll then create the tables for all the subsites. But then I also need to, because I want this plugin to work on both single sites and subsite installs, I need to have an option for if this isn't a multi-site or it's not being network activated. And then I can just um, call, so I can just say else over here. Sorry, my, my things pop up again when I click the wrong button. And then I can just call WP Learn create table. And that's the only change I need to make. So now when I activate this plugin on a single site, it'll just call create table once. If I activate it on a multi-site and it's being network activated, it'll loop through the sites and create all the different tables for me. So let's test this. If I go back to my database, I'm going to, first of all, sorry, before I go to my database, I'm gonna network deactivate the plugin. Um, I really should have a deactivation hook which deletes the table for me. Uh, that's just a bit of good practice, but I'm going to delete that form submissions table just to make sure. So there the form submissions table is no more. Um, and then I'm going to activate this. So if I network activate, now you will see that it. if I go back to my, you will see now there is WP form submissions, the first table for the main site. And there is WP two form submissions for the, the additional site. But now there's another caveat. What happens if a new site is registered? Now they own, there are no form submissions for that new site. So that's where you would do something like use the, and this gets back to the question that Jan had earlier, you would use one of the um, hooks. So maybe the WP initialize site hook. So let's open up that one. Um, And what this does is it, it passes in the new site object. So you could then have something hooked into that, which when a new site gets registered, it loads the, the fields for that site. Um, so you would need to think about that as well. So that's kind of how you have to think about your, your multi-site network and you're developing plugins or themes. Um, number one, admin menus and admin notices and those things, where do those go? How do those work? You can use things like is multi-site to check, are you in a multi-site or not? You would use things like is, uh, which one was it? Um, sorry, where are we? Is network admin versus is admin to check if you're in the admin dashboard. Um, and then if you're creating custom functionality, custom tables, you need to make sure that you're using the correct uh, switching to the blog, creating the new table, switching back and all of those kind of things. Okay, any questions around all of that? I know it's a lot to take in. Um, it's the kind of thing where the best thing to do is to test your plugin functionality on a multi-site network 
And that's where it gets back to what I was saying in the very first, uh, very first slide, which is test, 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 test. So have, have a multi-site network set up with one or two subsites, load your plugin or your theme, test them across the site, make sure the functionality works, then create a new site and see if their functionality works there. If it doesn't think about why and adjust things accordingly. Um, it's, it's not something that is, that is easy to sort of cover in a, in a short workshop, uh, but hopefully I've given you some ideas and some concepts to think about um, so that when you're building your plugins and themes, you, you have these things in mind. As I mentioned, finally, as I mentioned, if you are just using, and this is almost a, this is a good argument for not going too far outside of the WordPress ecosystem when it comes to developing your plugins or themes. If you were using, if I was using a custom post type, for example, for my form submissions, I wouldn't have to worry about any of this because when a new site is created, the, 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 the posts table uh, for that site is automatically generated. So if I was using custom post type and I was storing it as custom post type, that's how it would get stored. And I wouldn't have to worry about these things. It's only because I'm using a custom table that the problem comes in. Um, so use the core functionality of WordPress, the core option functionality, the, the core uh, uh, post meta functionality, the core post functionality, custom post types and all of that as much as possible. Um, but if you have to step out of that environment, if you have to create custom tables or any kind of custom storage of data or functionality, you do need to think about how that's going to operate in a multi-site network. Okay. Any questions on plugins specifically or anything else that I've covered today? Um, hopefully I've given you a, a sort of a, um, a view of what can happen in a multi-site network and what you have to think of. Uh, but are there any questions around any of that before we wrap up for today? Okay, cool. There don't seem to be any questions at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your kind words. Um, if there are questions around this topic uh, that, you, that you might think about afterwards, or if you're watching this on WordPress TV, you are welcome to leave them in the comments of this GitHub issue. Um, and, I will, and I will follow up afterwards if need be. Um, as I said, I am, I am preparing a tutorial on this, which will cover all this information as well with, with links and documentation and those kind of things. In that tutorial, I'm gonna try and do a little bit of a deeper dive into the functions. I've actually been thinking about spending a bit of time working on the documentation side and maybe creating a page specifically for multi-site that lists, that at the, at the very minimum, lists all the multi-site specific functions, hooks and action hooks and, and filter hooks, just at a minimum. So that folks can easily just go to that page and see all the multi-site specific stuff and then link through from there. Uh, so I'm going to try and think about if I, if I can do that uh, in the near future. If anybody out there has some time on their hands and they want to create that documentation, uh, please do go ahead. If you're not sure where to start, let me know and I'll gladly help you. But I do think it would be something that would be, would be super valuable. Um, other than that, thank you all for joining me today. It was lovely to see you all again. It was lovely to see my, my fellow hair, haircut friend, Mark. Um, thank, you, uh, thank you for joining me. And uh, I will see you around, I'm sure. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your Thursday, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I'll see you all next week.